<clears throat> Welcome everybody. Hey. I'm letting people in from the waiting room. Figure this one out. Uh, oh, oh, um, stop video. <clears throat> and I'm gonna start sharing my screen really quick. Welcome. Oops. Good to see everyone. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's so not going to work. <laughs> What's happening, Mike? Mr. Walden. Here we go. Uh, Welcome, everybody. Um, we've got a carousel of slides running through here with some Zoom tips um, <clears throat> with our agenda, kind of some Zoom norms. Hopefully you guys can all see this. There's an option to rename yourself too. If you're able to rename yourself with your name, your preferred pronouns, if you'd like, your organization, that's great. <clears throat> the waiting room music, welcome everybody. 16 people in the room. I see folks popping into the waiting room. Yay, lots of familiar faces, some new faces, some folks that are really committed and joining us from their car, it looks like, which is awesome. <laughs> we wanna learn about story maps and I'm gonna do it from anywhere, it's awesome. <clears throat> I got one better, I'm on a ferry on a car. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, you win at some sort of prize, that's amazing. That does make me feel a little better. <laughs> I've, I have had people join workshops while driving, and it's very, very disconcerting. <laughs> no, we're not a ferry. We're still at the dock. <laughs> Please tell me, Missy, you're leaving school and you're headed on vacation, and you're not just going to the grocery store. Nope, on my way home from the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, I do have 3.30 on my clock. So in a matter, uh, you know, to respect everybody's time, I'm gonna go ahead um, and get started here. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna stop sharing really quick so I can see everybody Brady Bunch style. But uh, this meeting is being recorded. You would have probably gotten that notice at the very beginning. Um, so if you don't want your images or words to be displayed, um, you can just mute yourself and turn off your camera and you will be anonymous to the recording. Um, so with that, uh, I just wanted to welcome everybody to the Story Mapping Virtual Workshop for teachers. My name is Meg, if we haven't met, and I'm the Network Coordinator for the Northeast Michigan Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative, which is one of the many partners that kind of came together to work on this workshop for 
uh, teachers. Um, I know there's lots of informal educators in the room as well. So some of those other partners or all those other partners include uh, Michigan State University Libraries. So we've got uh, a partner here that's gonna share and I'll do a little introduction later around that. Uh, Michigan Natural Features Inventory, Huron Pines, the Lake Huron Forever Initiative, um, the Center for Great Lakes Literacy, and then the Bay Area Community Foundation. So today in particular, we're going to hear from two amazing presenters about story map basics, essentially. Um, what they are, how you make a story map, um, <clears throat> the best practices around the elements that go into story map construction, and uh, what does a completed story map look like? And how can they be used as a communication tool for natural res resource conservation and uh, stewardship? And can they be used with students? Of course, they can be used with students and how does that work? So um, our presenters today are Amanda Tickner with the Michigan State University Libraries and Courtney Ross with Michigan Natural Features Inventory. Um, we're going to start today with Courtney sharing some story maps that she's created or that have been produced with MNFI, Michigan Natural Features Inventory, um, with a conservation lens, that conservation lens. And then Amanda is gonna guide us through some different types of story maps, the, those best practices for displaying and showcasing information, and then some open source tools for those who might not have an ESRI or ArcGIS account at their school yet. So these are tools you can use without an account. Um, and then we'll wrap up our time with a question and answer section. Uh, during the presentations, if you want to drop questions into the presentation, um, our presenters will try to incorporate them if they're not too complex, uh, but we will reserve some of those maybe a little more complex rabbit hole questions for a, a question and answer section at the end. <clears throat> we have a co-facilitator here too, Brandon Schroeder, who's going to be monitoring the chat uh, for the questions and putting them in a separate document. So our present presenters can answer them either during the Q&A section or if we don't get to them, perhaps afterwards. So um, with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and uh, let Courtney take it away. Courtney Ross is gonna open it up for us um, with what is a story map. So go ahead, Courtney. Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Courtney Ross. I'm a GIS research assistant with MNFI or Michigan Natural Features Inventory. Um, in my position, I help um, foster and manage Michigan's natural heritage database. I also help manage our RTS online organization and do a lot of development with uh, Esri tools, story maps being one of them. So that's why I'm here with you today. So just diving in, um, i share my screen quick. Let's see if I can get this pulled up. Okay, so what is story maps? Um, in, sh in short, story maps is a storytelling application that allows you to combine different multimedia content into an interactive digital display to tell a story. So a little background, this tool was developed by Esri, an international um, geographic information system or GIS software and web GIS application developer. Um, there's two different versions of story maps currently. One is for professional use and it's connected to their ArcGIS online platform, which allows users to kind of pull in a variety of um, their different tools into their story maps. And then they just launched another version. It's kind of a standalone for personal use and includes free storage up to about 10 stories and basic functionality um, and mapping. Um, you can also subscribe to this to kind of get the full suite of tools. Um, a bit of history, the application first launched in 2012. It's since exploded across the web, really, picking up momentum um, in 2020. And we can all kind of guess why that happened. We had to switch to a virtual world. <laughs> um, so organizations like National Park Service, the Library of Congress, um, National Geographic are just a few examples um, of who are using it today. So furthermore, teachers are using it for instructional purposes, um, stepping away from you know, traditional presentations, from PowerPoints or things like Canva. Uh, there's a, I saw a statistic that about 30% of all users of story maps are actually educators. So 
I think it's really an excellent method for teaching and learning about a variety of subjects, not just, you know, about geography and the environment, but um, yeah, a bunch of different subjects. So what kind of makes Story Maps a great tool? And this is going to kind of look like a pitch, but the website is great for sharing this. So we'll walk through it. Um, Story Maps allows you to add a variety of different multimedia content with ease. So you can pull in high quality images, videos from YouTube or other platforms, um, audio clips, and also embed web pages. One of my favorite features is the ability to create custom maps or add ready to use maps to kind of complement your story. Um, you can bring in your own data or use data from ArcGIS, Atlas, um, Living Atlas of the World, which is a huge digital public library managed by Esri as well. Um, includes like census data, different imagery and environmental layers as well. Amanda will also talk about some other examples of where you can get data. Um, you can create your own express maps where you can quickly just highlight areas of interest, create pop-ups, add different elements to a simple map, and then add that to your story. Um, there's also a few different formats that you can select from depending upon uh, what you want to focus on. So whether that be your text, photos, or maps, you can pull it all together um, with a theme as well. So this is how you can customize the color, the text, and other components like buttons or quotes um, to kind of set the tone of your story. Um, lastly, uh, Story Maps is really adaptable and can be shared um, and viewed on a variety of different devices without having to reformat anything. So whether it's like desktop, tablet, or your mobile device, it will still look slick and function uh, properly. It also has some access accessibility features such as keyboard navigation. You can have preset colors and fonts um, like for colorblind and then alt text and captions options for all visuals as well. So Amanda's gonna go into more detail about the different features and how to pull them into story maps in a bit. But before we dive into that, if you haven't um, really seen a story map before, I want to walk through some examples. Um, so within my job, I've mainly been using story maps as a means of outreach for uh, MNFI to engage with the public and our partners and promote the work that we do here. So first example, let's start from the beginning. So this one is called Fen Resilience in Southern Michigan. Um, this story is all about the endangered Mitchell Sater butterfly and how we partnered with Swimlick or Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy to better protect and manage their habitat on their preserve that they own. So we walk through the importance of the fen habitat as well as the history of the site um, in regards to management and survey efforts of the butterfly. So here's just a little intro about the project. We dive into information about the fen, why it's important, using a sidecar, which you'll hear about later. And just so you can pull in really great images um, to tell your story, talk about the butterfly here, come down, adding another great image of the fen. You can pull in charts and graphs. And then here's where I kind of talk about the history of the site. And I use a sidecar um, to tell, to showcase a timeline. So as I scroll through, you see the map on the left and it changes with different data points. As I get to different um, periods of time, you can see where burns have been done. Just kind of how I told the story and the history of management at the site. And you can pull in images and different text features um, within sidecars as well. All right. Just to jump in really quick, I'm going to be throwing in all of the links for the um, story maps that Courtney's going to be talking about in the chat. So you're welcome to copy and paste those and, and check them out outside of this Zoom too. Thanks, Becca. Thank you, Becca. All right. Um, so another example, uh, this is a public outreach piece that I created in 2020 to kind of introduce everyone to MNFI, our mission and also how they can help contribute to the statewide natural heritage database. 
Um, so we created um, a public form that you can use um, through an app or PDF, whichever way. Um, so this story map, I used a really cool video that one of our ecologists pulled together as kind of a promotional piece as well to kind of open it up to draw the, the user in. Um, there's a feature where you can have a menu at the top of a story map to kind of shift through the different sections of your story map and break it down a little bit easier. So I have the MNFI overview, pull in a quote feature. You can embed links. So here I have the um, a link to the form right here, which if I were to click on it, would pull up the actual form where they can submit data. I walk through some examples of collecting data. And here's an example of an express map. So just a quick pinpoint on a map, you can add a photo to it. And then I've also attached um, different PDFs. So I didn't realize that I wasn't going to be able to click on my links at the top with the panel up here. So let's go with that. That's all right. Yeah, if you want to stop sharing and then reshare, if you want to navigate, that might work. I'm not sure. That's all right. There isn't too much more on this one, but. Right. So, oh, yep, I need to stop sharing me share actually. Another example that I'm working on um, outside of Michigan Natural Features Inventory um, and actually with an MSU extension partner is um, this piece, it's on Shoreline Living. So I had a, um, a partner reach out to me asking about um, wanting to promote their work um, with the Midwest Glacier Lakes Partnership. Um, and turn their shoreline living booklet into an online interactive version. So they created this paper version that they've been sending out to folks, but they also wanted to make it accessible on the web. So I've helped them start to turn this into a story map. So this is kind of what the article looks like. And then doing that, I've pulled it into a collection of articles or a collection of story maps now. So this is what a collection can look like. If I hit get started. Um, it draws you into just kind of an introduction about um, the importance of protecting shoreline habitat on inland lakes. Then here I've used um, kind of a cool 3D mapping feature. So if I click on one of the lakes, it'll zoom in to that area. Then I can also click here, which will take me to the article, which I haven't started yet, but this is kind of the the framework of what I'm working on. Right. And I also want to show you some examples of educators and different things you can do without just natural resources as well. Um, so this is a collection that um, was pulled together by the Sasonian Anacosta Community Museum. Um, it basically turned, it created a digital field trip, field trip of one of their exhibits um, called A Right to the City. So it walks the user through, um, or it kind of tells the story using a few maps and tons of historic images um, of how Washington has changed and shaped over the years, highlighting stories on injustice and gentrification and a call to action. So there's tons of different ways that you can talk about um, or just tell stories with story maps. Some of the images, it's just a really cool story map. So this is an express map, walking through these different data points. Another really cool one I found is living in the age of humans. So talking about Anthropocene. Um, so it just kind of, there's really graphics that you can, cool graphics that you can create and scroll through. I think this one is really cool. <laughs> um, there. Again, just pulling together different topics together into one big. So this one's talking about globalization. 
living land. So global land use and agriculture, going in different images. World of forests, so forestry practices, um, deforestation, those types of things. And then of course, biodiversity. So I'm scrolling through these really quick, quick but uh, Becca has all those um, links coming in too. Another neat one that I found from National Geographic. Um, so say a science teacher was had a marine lesson um, and wanted to teach people about sea turtles and sea turtle research. This is a collection that talks about um, you know, how this researcher got into the field. So it gives you an introduction to her. Then it goes through the life history of sea turtles, talks about a field site here in the third story. Um, it pulls in some maps and data. Um, other research projects and then threats. So, um, you know, it could be a whole lesson on sea turtles that you could deliver to a student. And lastly, this one kind of pulls in a whole bunch of different tools that um, Esri offers through RGS Online. Um, and it's a really simple idea. So it's just mapping your favorite color. So the user would, you know, come in, interact, they could pick their favorite color, add it to this map below, and then you can just see um, all the different data points that have come in. I think they have almost 2,000. So this is a web map that's embedded. Here they've pulled in a dashboard. Um, you can see that blue is the favorite color. <laughs> just a way to visualize data. Um, and here's a heat map. So where is all the data coming from? just different tools that you can pull in um, with story maps. So those are just some examples. Um, I guess I don't know if there's any questions. Um, I guess the general idea of story maps before Amanda kind of digs into the, the actual workshop piece of it all. Go ahead. Thanks, Courtney. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a big emphasis on like good images. So that's probably a priority. If you want to create a good story map, you need some good video, some good pictures. Um, so priority for that for our teachers when they're thinking about, you know, maybe telling the story of a place um, and using data as well. So thanks, Courtney. Yeah. If there are any questions, um, <clears throat> if you want to type them in the chat, that would be great. We do have quite a few participants here. So. Um, and Courtney can try to answer them now, but Amanda's really going to go into like the bones, uh, the meat, I guess the bones, the meat and the potatoes of like, okay, this is really cool. How do I do this <laughs> kind of thing? So um, <clears throat> if there aren't any questions, I'll pass the mic to her and let her take it away from me. Okie doke. So yeah, I am here to show you this tool. Um, my name is Amanda Tickner. I am the Geographic Information System Lost Librarian at Michigan State University. And you may not be familiar with that kind of job title. So basically, what is it? Um, I help people learn tools like this. That's actually my primary thing. So if people have questions about mapping products, um, I help them out. Um, people have questions about research methods, I help them out. If people can't find data, I help them with that. So those are kind of my primary things. So this is in my wheelhouse. If you have questions after this workshop, and run into issues or anything. Um, I just type my email in the chat there. Feel free to email me. Uh, happy to help. So I'm going to start sharing my screen, hopefully. Yeah, and we'll share Courtney and Amanda's contact information afterwards, as well as all the links for the story maps. So Brandon is diligently capturing them in our agenda notes. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, and I will also post in there. Yeah. So I'm going to be working with some images today. If you have an account and you want to play along um, and kind of you know follow all the steps, you can. Uh, you can download the stuff I'm working with. Um, it's not super exciting, quite frankly, but you know, by intention, which I'll explain. Uh, but if you want to, it's in the Google Drive. Um, so that is there. OK, sharing the screen.
Okay, this is the login page for the the uh, story map version that is integrated within the general ARC online environment. As uh, Courtney mentioned last month, <laughs> they dropped in true Esri fashion. Why they do this? I do not know. Uh, the fact that they are sort of splitting story maps up and not giving it a new name. So extra confusion. And they do this with a lot of products. I, I don't understand. But anyway, so there's sort of two parallel versions of, of story maps. But they do the same thing. And they have the same functionality, mostly. They're just structured within the way that Esri charges them people for them slightly differently, essentially. Um, so this, this version of story maps is integrated within ARC Online organizations. Um, if you don't have one, it's usually pretty easy for educational institutions to get one. Uh, you can go and, and ask Esri, and they're, they're a pretty generous company, and will we'll usually give you licenses. Um, if they don't, uh, there is a public version of, of ARC Online. Um, and I will, as I go through here, I will try and highlight where there are differences. So if you're a public account, you might have to do things slightly differently um, than if you have an institutional account. Okay. Um, so this is storymapstarter.arcgis.com. I'm assuming it's up there. I love the way Zoom just covers over if you're working on the web. It's so handy. No, it's not. Um, one thing I will say about the story maps, which is an advantage over a lot of, of other Esri software is, and software in general, is you don't have to ask people to install anything. Um, it is a web-based software and that, or an app. And, and that makes it a lot lower bar for classes to use. Um, so you don't have to ask people to install things. So if you're, if you're working as an educator and you have a classroom full of people, they just need a login, which is a lot easier than figuring out, will this work on which operating system and all that. Hello, blue. So, all right. So I'm going to sign in. Um, if you have an organizational account, usually what you'll do is you'll put put it down here, um, and you'll preface your organization's URL in there and, and run through those steps. If you want to make a public account, um, you don't have an account. You play around with this thing. You can just make one there. Um, so pretty straightforward. It also, I think. Uh, We'll connect to your sign-ins for other things. This is kind of new. I don't mess with that. <laughs> I just log in. Come on, there we go. So here we go, this is our dashboard. Um, so today I'm just gonna kind of demo things, point some things out, um, talk a little bit about the affordances of story maps and, and how you might think about content for story maps and which story maps aspects might be best for you. Um, one thing I do want to point out here is this quick links down on the side here. There's tutorials. So if you, you know, I'm going to be kind of going fairly, at a fairly brisk pace. I'm not going to rush, rush, but, you know, doing some things. So if you uh, want to go back and learn more things, uh, there's tutorials in there. Uh, they also have some good tips on story planning, so about creating narrative, which, as I'll talk about, is probably the most important thing, honestly. Uh, the tool is very, very easy. <laughs> it's a very nice and simple, intuitive tool to use. Um, I almost am embarrassed to show people how to use it because it's like, really, I feel a little redundant. But um, yeah, so, and there's Explore Stories, which is like a bunch of galleries of stories. Uh, so Courtney did a great introduction. Um, thanks for that. And showed us a bunch of stories. If you want to see even more stories, um, you can click that link and kind of poke through them. I will say that sometimes um, some of the stories that you run across in their galleries have been enhanced uh, by JavaScript in different ways that may not actually be accessible for somebody just using their straight, up, straight out of the box product. So that's something to be aware of. Um, if, you know, if you're frustrated, you can't find a feature that that's appearing in one of the example story maps. Well, that's probably what's going on. They've got some JavaScript going on there. Uh, that does happen. So uh, lots of cool stuff in there. Um, here's your dashboard here. Um, all of my old stories uh, are here. Uh, if I have favorited stories, they will go here. Groups. So I'm going to talk for a second about collaboration. 
which is kind of the bugaboo of using this in classroom settings, honestly. It's, it's the problem as far as I'm concerned. Um, Esri does not make collaboration easy. <laughs> they just don't. Uh, so if you want to have a group of people working on a single story map, the way that you have to do it is you need to make a group or have your administrator make a group uh, it, within your ARC Online instance, your ARC Online account, which should be connected to the story map uh, account here, and then add people to it. And then if you make sure that when you make that group, the editing privileges are turned on, uh, when sh people share things to that group, other people in that group should be able to edit them. And you'll have to sort of manually add them. So if I go over here to my groups, I've made a bunch for classes. <laughs> Uh, and there's also the Kellogg Nature Center. I made one for them. So unfortunately, because I'm an admin, I'm actually a group member on all these different groups that I have nothing to do with making the content of. Um, and I don't look, I try to kind of you know, convert, but anyway. Um, but that's how you do it. You would kind of go here if you had a shared project and, and click into it. Um, and if you want to see, this is kind of what's going on all over MSU. <laughs> uh, your whole organization, if anyone shared their stuff to, oh, I helped out with some troubleshooting on that one. Um, I'm glad they got it sorted. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Uh, they, you know, you can check out what other people in your group are doing. MSU being big, we've got a fair number. So back to my stories. Um, the cautionary tale, the person, I saw that Byzantine coins and I was like, oh yeah. Um, they managed to really mess up their story map. <laughs> they were collaborating with some people, some things got deleted, um, the, the, something crashed, some text got erased, it was bad. So what I always tell people about using story maps is it is a web app and they do a really good job of saving stuff and it, and it seems very seamless and very nice. Always save your stuff somewhere else. Um, you know, don't, don't rely on, this is not an archive. Okay. <laughs> it's not a repository. It's not, a, this is not a Google drive. Um, you know, save the text and pictures of your story somewhere else. Um, because this is not a substitute. Also, uh, if you are doing a big collaborative project, like if you're sharing something to a group, what you can do down here under quick actions is you can duplicate your story. So this is really helpful if you're, if you've gotten to a certain point in your story. Uh, and you're you're far, pretty far along. You might want to just duplicate it, uh, just to make sure that things don't go awry, um, and you have a backup. As I said, this is a pretty reliable tool, but you know more backups are better because if something does go wrong, there's really no way to recover it at all. Um, and it does. I'll go into this too. It does auto save. <laughs> so if you decide you want to revert back to an old version. There isn't one, really, unless you do this duplicate. OK, so um, I'm going to now get into the, the meat of the thing and, and start a story. So the way that I do this, you can see here, I've got a little lot of Little Red Riding Hood stories. <laughs> That's because uh, I use that as the frame for teaching this thing, um, because um, I don't want to focus too hard on the content when I'm explaining the tool. Um, and everyone knows the story of the Lord Riding Hood. But that does bring us back before I open up the tool, I'm gonna to sort of go back to the narrative part of this. Um, it is important to have a narrative, which sounds like a strange thing to say, but I've seen a lot of people make these story maps, well, students especially, uh, unfortunately students in their term paper in my class, uh, where they just throw a bunch of content into the thing. And, they, and, it, and it looks good because it's a slick tool but it's kind of nonsense um, because there's no narrative. So you need to have well-organized content, well-curated content, because you don't want to put too much in there. It's very tempting with photos. <laughs> I just made this trip tour and oh my, did I violate that rule? Um, and think about your story. Think about who your audience is and what it is you're telling them. You know, All the basics of narrative apply here. Uh, and thinking that through ahead is super important. Um, you know, it's fine and I encourage just opening the tool and playing around and seeing, you know, what you can do. But ultimately, if you're trying to make a thing to showcase a thing, um, having that kind of frame outline framework, something um, 
as you're going into the tool is really important. Uh, just identifying your audience, identifying your content, identifying kind of what the goal of your narrative is and what components are key to that. Um, super important. Okay. So um, I'm now moving the Zoom window. Actually, I'm going to minimize the Zoom window. Go. It's all gone now. Just a little. Actually, you know what? I'm not. <laughs> I really. It's it's strangely disorienting not to see somebody on the screen. It's I. I lied. I'm putting it back up. Okay. Here we go. Um, new story. So this is where you can start your story. And there's some different options here. And we've got start from scratch, and we've got sidecar, and we've got guided map tour, we've got explore map tour. I'm going to show you these these quick start ones. All of these types can be incorporated in the start from scratch. I strongly suggest uh, starting out with the quick start stuff before maybe going to the start from scratch. Or the start from scratch is really if you have a vision. <laughs> Like if you if you know really know uh, what you want your web uh, presence to look like, uh, then maybe. Um, but I've seen sort of the start from scratch kind of it it goes into a hot mess real quickly if you don't have that. But you can. I mean, basically any of this stuff, like I said, all these quick start things, and a bunch of other stuff can be incorporated into the start from scratch model. Um, you just kind of need to have a bit of a plan. Um, Whereas for class, I really think sidecar, just sidecar is usually adequate. Um, so if I'm encouraging people to use this as, as a kind of collaborative tool in a class for presenting group work, usually I will send it to sidecar. Um, and that's the one I'm gonna kind of go into detail with. Um, but a lot of what I talk about in here is gonna apply to content blocks you can put into the start from scratch. Okay. So sidecar. Um, just going to open that. It's going to launch. So uh, I'm going to say Little Red Riding Hood. So we're going to title this thing. Just get some content in there. And I'm probably going to misspell things because that's what I do. So there we go. Now I'm going to add a cover image. Um, browse my files. Hey, little roading hood. We're going to add some woods. So this is a this is where hmm, perhaps a bit roads diverge a little bit uh, for the public versus the institutional accounts. Um, the institutional accounts will let you upload and save video and photos directly to uh, the story map. If you are working with public account, those um, capacities are somewhat truncated. And so you will probably need to link out to somewhere else where those photos and items are hosted. Um, but in this case, I'm just gonna add it. So here we go, we've got, we've got a good start here. Now we've got some content in. I'm gonna show you some stuff about design. So, um, oh, and notice here, it says saved. It's already saving. So it's auto saving. So like I said, if you if you want to kind of have different versions to work off of, make sure to do that duplicate thing because it just will save over whatever you're you're doing. So if you want to have navigation, those uh, little um, toolbar here that will let you jump to parts of the story, you can turn that on. If you want to change the theme, and usually I do, uh, you can do that here. There are a bunch of different themes. Um, to check out. Um, and then I like to let's see, do that, uh, where the title is over the top. So you can kind of mess with that a bit. So that is design. Um, and you can also theoretically create your own custom themes too, if you wanted, um, within, I think, some parameters. So here we go, we've got that. Um, got our title going. A thing that is true of all media that we're adding is that under options, properties, you can add alternative text. And you know, I, I imagine everyone in the room knows what that is. Um, but basically, it's what a screen reader would read. 
So if someone is encountering your um, story map using a screen reader and not their eyes, um, the alternative text is important to help them know what the pictures are. And because story maps are so, so very visual, um, I think alternative text is really important. And you want the alternative text to be short and pithy. Uh, you know, you don't want to be too elaborate in the description. Um, just really simple because you, you know, you have a paragraph in there. Having a screen reader read that is a lot. Um, but it is important to put something in there because otherwise it's going to just read off what your JPEG is <laughs> titled, which is usually like JPEG 1270 or something. Nobody needs that interrupting their narrative. So and that is that. So now sidecar. Sidecar, and the reason I do sort of often suggest this for classes is because it basically functions with slides, right? Each sidecar is a single slide. And so it's very easy to kind of assign people portions of the narrative or, you know, say, okay, you're responsible for slides that cover these things. Add or to a class for an assignment. I'm, I'm helping a class with that this week, in fact, where the instructors basically said, take your essay and put it into two slides. So everyone gets two slides to make a collaborative project. So it's a very easy way to divvy, divvy stuff up. Um, and we're all super familiar with it from using PowerPoint, perhaps too much. So um, <laughs> it's pretty, pretty intuitive and straightforward. Um, and it's also easy to rearrange your uh, your slides to kind of shift the narrative if you need to. It's a very straightforward organizational thing. So I'm just going to show you all the things you could do with sidecar slides. Notice over here, add media. Um, it's almost required that you have some kind of visual in this one. And so that that is one sort of disadvantage of the sidecar is that it really does require that you have some kind of image to go along with your text, uh, image map, something. Um, if you don't, you know, or you have kind of sparse or don't have content for each thing, sometimes it gets a little tricky to design. And that's where maybe you want to shift to that freeform design, uh, which is more tech, can be more text heavy without the constraint of needing to add media. So here you can see all the stuff that you can add. Um, this is the what's called the main stage of the of the sidecar. Uh, and you can add an image, and that's what I'm going to do to start with. So again, if you were using a public account, you would just link to uh, imagery hosted on the web. Generally speaking, I suggest that you have that imagery under your own control in a Flickr account. I know Flickr is super archaic, uh, but it actually works fairly well for, for image hosting for within Story Maps. Um, but what I do not suggest people do, but it's expedient is uh so i you know understand it uh you can go to wikipedia and right click and say copy image location and get the url and pop it in there and use things that are essentially hosted on wikipedia or wherever um you find an image on the web the problem with that is that it is not under your control and somebody else can change that imagery uh and if for some reason your story map goes big and you have thousands of hits on this thing, whoever is hosting that image might notice and get really irritated and just delete the image or worse yet, swap it out for something untoward. Um, so think carefully <laughs> when you're using linked images, it's basically. So I am going to upload a file a thing though. I'm gonna get a picture of our heroine here, Little Lord Riding Hood, and I'm gonna add that. And uh-oh, she's headless. <laughs> this happens a lot. Um, basically, uh, they, the software will try and just guess where the focal point of the thing is when it's too big for the frame. Um, and sometimes it guesses wrong. So what you have to do is you have to go in and you can either say fill and sort of change that focal point, get her head up, say save. Then you've got a different portion of the, the uh, image showing, or what I prefer to do myself is just fit the image in. Say, okay, so now it all fits. So that's that's how you deal with that, real simple. Um, and you can add text. Bam, 
Um, and you can add actually a lot of other things too here. So you can basically add all the same things that you can add with a sidecar over here, over here. Okay, this is brand new. I have not messed with it yet, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And that is another thing that I will say about story maps. They're adding stuff constantly. Um, and usually it's kind of good. So yeah, so the button is the thing that um, Courtney mentioned earlier, where she, you click on the button and took, to a, took people to a survey. So basically a button is a fancier um, in-text link. It's a way of, of calling out um, a link to other material elsewhere. Um, yeah, so text is kind of the most obvious one, but you can add other things. So you can have pictures on both sides if you want. Okay, so that's our first slide. I'm going to add, this time I'm going to show you, so that's adding uh, a map, or sorry, an image. I'm going to show the map tools um, in brief, in very brief. So these are some examples of maps uh, made in, in ARC Online, various weird things that I've done, usually in conjunction with classes. Um, I am not going to show you how to make map in ARC Online. It is way beyond the scope of this workshop, um, but it is available. You can make your own custom maps. Uh, usually if you're doing that, you wanna have some kind of location data in a, in a um, comma separated values spreadsheet type, which you can make by just saving an Excel spreadsheet as a comma separate value. And you can make these point maps really, really easily. So just know that it's there. <laughs> uh, but so that's one type of content you could add. You could add your own uh, ARC Online map that you've made. The other thing though, and this is really what I want to show you, is this express map. Uh, so maybe you don't have an elaborate ARC Online map made. Maybe you just want to make, just show a couple points. So boom, you can show a couple points. So this is a map that lets you do that. Um, and I've, oh, I guess it saved my base map preference, which is a little weird. Um, usually I have to switch to this. Um, you can change your base maps uh, under options. Um, to change a, to a different one. Bunch in here, if you like National Geographic, uh, there is a Nat Geo one. Anyway, I gotta find my antique one again. There we go. Um, so you can do that. Uh, you can add sort of features to your express map, like search if you want people to be able to search for a specific place and sort of navigate to that. Um, oftentimes that's kind of good for accessibility. Um, if people can't use a mouse, it's nice to have a search tool that they can tab into. Uh, so, but what I really, the, the action happens here is where you can draw the features. And so I'm gonna zoom to a spot that I want to highlight. And we're gonna pretend, I usually think of Little Red Riding Hood as happening in Germany. So we're gonna go to Germany, find something that looks vaguely Foresty, although hmm, this base map is not great for forest, but we're just going to pretend. Add a point and then sort of say what you want about it. House. And you can add an image. You can add a description. You can change the style of the point to be uh, something that you upload or, you know, the default there and change the color. You can do a lot of customization, but let me see done. I'm going to add another point. Let me say grandma's house is far. <laughs> done. And then this always fills me with delight. Uh, you can add an arrow. <laughs> And y'all aren't probably GIS professionals, but it, for whatever reason, it is really hard in GIS software to, to add arrows, to, to make arrows at all. It's just super hard. So this is kind of delightful to me. Make an arrow. Yeah, and you can add tech, add annotation. So if you want to call something out, whoop, you could conceivably like add an arrow. Whoop. Like, I don't know, add some text. Yeah, something like that. So the, the, these are pretty versatile, actually. Um, 
so if you know your location, you know, you can search to places, you can add the stuff and it's all there and you have a nice, nice little web map. The one thing I will say about these express maps though, that um, is kind of a bummer is that you can't share them between Esri softwares. Um, so if you make an express map, you're not gonna necessarily be able to put that into Arc Online. You probably can't share it with maybe other story maps. It's kind of localized, um, which is a bit of a bummer. So that's another slide. So the other thing, and Courtney talked about this in terms of adding maps. So we've got Arc Online content, we've got Express Map content, and we have Living Atlas content. And Living Atlas is kind of fabulous. Um, as Courtney mentioned, um, there's just a ton of stuff in here. Lots and lots of stuff. Um, all kinds of topics and different areas. And they have sort of categories that you can kind of browse through. So environment, one of them. Uh, lots and lots and lots of stuff. Um, find things with forests and most of them are global not all of them a lot of them, some of them are, are u.s centric but most a lot of them are global well, like this one north america so usually it tells you if it's not global um but uh what i want to point out about this is that within story map you can definitely search and you browse and all that sometimes it doesn't show you every last piece of living atlas content um it's kind of got a curated set for story maps if you want to browse the whole thing you can go here and browse the whole thing. I'm not gonna jump out to that because it doesn't like the back button super well. And I would have to kind of start over. But once you do that, if you find one you like, you can hit this, add to favorites. Um, and when you do that, it will appear here. So you can kind of create uh, curated sets of, of data that you found in Living Atlas that might be useful. So I'm just gonna pop that in there, well, forests. and show the forest, so, so that's useful. You know, talk about it somehow. And Esri is usually pretty good about kind of giving you information about these things too. Um, I guess if we go back, I'll just add another slide go back into the Living Atlas content. I don't want to zoom out too far, but you know, you can kind of, oops, I just added it. Anyway, it will, it will tell you where it got its data from, which is good. Um, close this. Back to here. Okay, so we've got our kinds of maps. We've got images. I'm gonna add a few more things. Um, so you can add an embedded other website which is good if you have one. You can add a swipe, um, which, eh, show at the end if we have time. The other type of thing that you can add, um, oops, actually, let me very quickly get out here, get my link, YouTube. Back over here, link. So if I wanna add a YouTube link, you can do that. Um, it'll also let you, in theory, upload um, video content if you have it. But this is an example of how you can add things from YouTube. So. Amanda, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Sure. Um, the first one is, are we able to make a story map and make it a part of a web page? Yes, uh, it does have, I believe it has embed capabilities. Um, and I think I've actually done that. I've, I've done that where I've embedded a story map that I made onto our website too. So, and then the, uh, another question here, is there a way to do alt text for the maps? 
I'm assuming those are the express maps that we're making. Uh, let's go back. So we do edit settings here, options. There it shows up. So yes. <laughs> so basically all this, Esri has done a pretty good job of, of making things accessible. Uh, and so they, they do pretty much everything you can add, I believe, all text too. So yeah. Any other questions? You good? OK. No. All right. So that's all that. Add a couple more and then show you some very fast stuff about I'm going to go quick, quick, quick here. Just add a little more content. Uh, let's see. Tea with grandma. Some stuff just to show you some things. Just add some walls, and then I'm going to add oops, the last image. Okay. And just looking at, oh, I already added that one. Aha, so now I get to show you delete, which is one of the goals of adding this content. Um, so if you, you end up with redundant slides or you want to delete something, it's really easy. You just go here and you say delete. In this case, I'm going to delete. Yes, delete. So really easy. You can't undo it though. <laughs> so like I said, if you're working on like a complex project, you've got a lot of stuff, um, just be aware of that. Add one more image. So there we've got the Huntsman. These isn't super important. OK, um, so let's say you've got things that are out of order, because obviously the Huntsman is not going to kill the wolf after they've had tea. Uh oh, is there a question? Hmm. Okay. I think um, someone muted themselves, but we're, we're, we're good. Just okay. All right. So you can just move things around, which is delightful. I think it's delightful anyway. So there's the wolf visiting grandma. There you can move the huntsman, huntsman to the right spot. Really easy. Uh, the other thing you can do, like I said, is delete really easy. Boom. Decide having a fight or isn't uh, PC or not PC. Uh, what is the, anyway, not kid friendly. You want to delete it. Uh, go ahead, delete it. Uh, there it is. But who's that? So this one I'm going to show, you can add background audio. Uh, so if you have audio to go along with your, your file, um, you can add it down there and preview it. <laughs> yep, so that's what that is. So, um, and it's not obnoxious. <laughs> well, it's a little obnoxious, but it's not super obnoxious in the sense of it doesn't autoplay. Uh, the user who's, who's viewing it does have the option of turning it on and off. So it's not gonna like intrude on their experience too much. Okay, so um, that's kind of the gist of the thing. Uh, we've added a bunch of content, we have, we have the thing. So let's say we wanna preview and see what this thing looks like. So we can go here and hit preview. And what's cool is that down here, it'll let you preview it for all sorts of devices. So right now we're previewing it as if it's full screen on the desktop. Um, and you can see what that looks like. If you wanna see what it looks like on a phone, you can do that, drag that. I am really surprised at how well it works on phones, actually. Um, it works very well on phones. Um, really surprised how well they did that. So that is how you preview things. Uh, you close the preview when you're done. 
if uh, you decide you're, you're finished, finished, uh, you publish it. So publishing it here, you have sharing levels. You can just publish it to yourself. So only you can see it. Um, you can publish it to your organization. You can publish it to the public. Uh, you can share it to your group when you publish it. Um, it just depends on what you want to do. When you share it to everyone public, um, you can then share the URL out, embed the URL and so forth. Um, and, and that's kind of how sharing works. So hypothetically, after you publish it, um, and notice again, auto-saving, everything auto-saves. So once you publish it, um, it's going to check for, oh. Ah, OK, so it warns you. <laughs> I didn't realize they'd done this. This is annoying. Uh, this is kind of new. So uh, because you're using Living Atlas content, sometimes that is um, kind of obnoxious for people that aren't in your organization to see, which is one of the downsides, because it may require logins. Um, it's worth checking to make sure that if you're using Esri content, that all of it can be accessed by everyone if you want the story to be public. So now, you know, our editing tools are kind of gone after I publish. And if you want to start editing again, if you open this thing up and you want to start editing again, you just go back here and you, you can edit it. Okay. Amanda, we do have a couple more questions coming in. All right. Um, the first one is, where is the duplicate option again? And I wasn't oh. sure if that was the, for the duplicating the whole story map or for individual slides. It is for the whole story map. Okay. And it is in your your content. Now I will go back there in a second and okay. show you. And then the other question was for multiple stories, did you say you recommend using a collection? You can, yes. So collection is is a collection of story maps. And yes, you can do that. It basically makes a little gallery of all your story maps. So it's a nice little thing. Yes. Okay. And where is that located? Is that like uh let's go back to my home? My projects. So uh, first, first issue off the top is duplicate. So duplicate is under these dots. A lot of things hang out under dots um, in these apps. So there's the duplicate. So if you do that, it's just going to say you're going to make a copy. Yes. And it'll duplicate it eventually, and hopefully not crash. Come on. <sighs> Maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> All right, so now it's telling me, yes, it's a copy and so forth. And if I go back to my stuff, my projects, you can see there's the copy, right? So they've, it's basically split it. And then, oh yeah, the collections. Uh, so collections are here. I haven't used them extensively, but basically you just add, it's collection builder and you just add things to form this gallery, so. Um, add to collection, your content. And some of it can just be images and stuff, I guess. I didn't quite realize that, but so, yeah. Perfect. So that's collections. And then, oh, I want to go back to my stories so this up here. OK, so this is, I just showed you Sidecar. I want to really quickly show you Map Tour. And uh, there's kind of a. I think it's tricky, frankly, um, thing about map tours. So a map tour is just where you have the typical pins. And this is one where if the geography, if the location of the thing is super important uh, and, and very integral to the story, you might want to consider using a map tour, especially if you have less text content. Um, so basically, you've got pins and you've got um, content, picture, text to go with the pins. Uh, and there's two kinds. There's Explorer, which is basically freeform, where people can just kind of go wherever. Uh, and the guided map tour kind of puts things sequentially. We'll give things numbers, one, two, three, four. So if you have uh, kind of a, a narrative of maybe a trail, for example, that you wanted to, to follow, uh, you might use a guided map tour. Whereas if you have a collection of relevant photos in an area, um, you might use an Explorer map tour. The thing is, um, if you start this tool, which I'm going to do here, and then I'm going to go back because we're not going to want this one. Um, 
you add them one at a time as if they were slides. Uh, and there just isn't a great way of that I've been able to find of adding things in batch. So let's get out of here. If you, if you start from scratch, you can add a map tour that lets you add in batch, which is really nice. Because if they're geotagged, that'll save you a lot of effort. Um, you don't have to sit there and figure out where each one of these photos goes. You can just uh, upload a bunch and a go. So here I've got four places. I can just open them. I had, when I took them on my phone, uh, location information being embedded into the, the photos. Uh, and so it knows where they were taken. So you pick your, pick your type here. And, you, and once you've picked your layout, um, it's, it's kind of hard to go back. Um, it doesn't let you switch from guided to explorer. Um, it's kind of annoying. But and usually I'll do a grid, but sometimes list. You know, it's a style thing. That bit you can change later. Um, but now we've got all the points and they're all there. So I like to show people that because I feel like it's hidden. They don't make it very clear that you can do batch upload if you're just adding it to the from scratch versus the, the quick start ones. I don't know why that is, but it is a thing. So with the tour, um, you know, you've got your, your image. Um, you can name it and you can put in a bunch of text and you can put in more pictures. Well, actually I lied, you can't. I thought you could. Um, you can put in text, you can put in a button to other web content and you can put in audio clips. So if you wanna make an audio tour, it's kind of a nice little option to have maybe sound for, for your points. But again, this is one this format I don't feel lends itself as well as Sidecar or kind of the free form adding text to having a lot of text. Um, people, this, you know, you have a point and you, if you have a bunch of text, yes, you can scroll. It will let you scroll. You can add as much, well, you can't add infinite amount of text. It cuts you off at a certain number of words, but, um, you know, you can put a lot in there. People, it's harder for people to engage with that, I think, um, frankly. I just, you know, your mileage may vary, but I find that the, the sidecar one is kind of better suited to large blocks of text, whereas this is kind of for emphasizing the location of something and the briefer descriptions. Just my take on the thing. So from here, um, you know, let's say you've got a map tour. You can also, there's a bunch of other weird little things in here. Um, this image gallery is kind of nice. If you have a bunch of photos, you can pitch them in here. And it all it does, this one is, is very uh, text limited. Uh, it just makes a gallery of, of photos. Um, but the one I wanted to show you was this one, the swipe. So what the swipe is, is you just have two stuff, two things, images, web maps, whatever, and you toggle between them. So I'm going to add... Hopefully I can find this because it's been a minute. Turkey. Turkey. This was a historic map from the 1700s that was published in Gentleman's Magazine that some students of mine georeferenced. So you pop that in there and then you can add a web map. Uh, yeah, let's just, oops, let's ditch that. Uh, Maybe just a very basic base map. Um, kind of zoom that to Turkey. And you can kind of toggle between them. So again, this, this map on the left is, is one that, so the historic map image was taken and given location information. Uh, so it was sort of squiggled over modern uh, to make it fit, okay. And I'm probably going to do a workshop on that in fall in the library. So if you're interested in georeferencing, <laughs> stay tuned. Um, but you can see how the swipe tool works here. You can compare two things. So if you have historic photographs and a modern photograph of a place, this is a nice little option. It's pretty dramatic.
So. Yeah, I love that. There was a comment, the swipe is so cool, student favorite. And then we did have another question just about kind of some tech on the back end um, mm -hmm. from a teacher. So she has, uh, the question says, how can you log in elementary students that don't have emails? Students are currently working under her login as our, um, our GIS mentor and tech staff can't figure out the logins. So I don't know if you can provide any insight there. Okay. Um, I, I can't necessarily, honestly, like I, I, I would for collaborate. I don't know how to say this uh, without kind of being not super diplomatic and perhaps wearing the, the naughty hat. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that MSU is tightly licensed in its Esri accounts, I might suggest to instructors that they just give people <laughs> one login. Um, so I, I, I don't have a great solution for it. In some ways you're doing it in what I think of as the most efficient way possible. Uh, it's not technically great for Esri's licensing, but really um, it, they don't make this easy for us. And, and that could be the most straightforward way. However, um, in theory, your administrators, if you have an ARC Online organizational instance should be able to make people accounts. Uh, usually you could, it's really straightforward in the admin dashboard. Um, you just go to members, you make a new account. I, I'm not sure what's going on there with your administrators that they can't handle that. Uh, and which is no aspersions cast on your administrators. I didn't mean to do that, but you know, um, it's just, I'm not sure what's going on with your organizational account that they wouldn't have access to that. That's um, yeah, we might uh, table that question for the end too, because I know there's some other, there was a comment here about uh, an administrator being able to create specific logins. And I know there are some teachers that are administrators for their own school's account too, that might be able to provide some insight there as well. So, yeah, it's it's pretty straightforward. If you're, if you have admin privileges in an ARC online account, you can make logins. Yeah, and you can make them to, you know, Right now, our instance is tied to NetID login, so it's tied to the university login, which saves me a lot of hassle trying to sunset accounts when people graduate and stuff like that. I have a lot of concerns that an elementary administrator would not have. Uh, so for for that, like I could imagine even just making like a couple login, like a login for a class project, you know, that kind of thing, and, and not necessarily making them for each individual student. I think you have a little more flexibility in that environment. Um, so, all right. So this is this is uh, story maps. Um, I was going to quickly show you an open source tool um, in addition to story maps. Um, so, does anyone have any questions about story maps before we we turn to this other story map tool? Yes, there are a lot of things out there called story maps. Uh, one question here, can you briefly explain again how you can create a group story map in order to have multiple contributors? Right, so we're going to go back over here. So basically, this is another admin thing, honestly, um, unless you're, whoa, okay, this did not take me where I thought it was going to take me, that's fine, uh, groups. So as an admin here, I can make a group, uh, and then I just add people who are within my organization, like this person, to a group. So like this one, I had, I made this for a class. I was the owner. I made sure that uh, it had items shared with the group, can be modified by all members of the group, checked. And then I found the class's accounts and added them to it. Uh, and then once you do that, if you go to your content, so this is the ARC Online portion of the thing. Um, you can check that and share to a group. You can also, within Story Map itself, if I can get back there because the silly thing is hiding my. Come on. Come on, browser. All right. This is not great. I really wish. There we go. Phew. Um, if you go to story map again, um, you can also sit there and go, 
Oops, once you've published it. You I guess you have to go to your ARC Online. I thought you could share it from here, but I guess you have to go to your ARC Online account and share it to your group there. But once you do, then it appears over here in your groups. Once you click, you know, your group content will appear over here. Like I said, they do not make this super easy. And if you want to specify what group, like let's say I want everything from them, that'll come up. Um, it's not the most straightforward thing. And uh, if you don't have admin privileges, sometimes the account settings for your organization, I think the default is to not let people make groups that can share stuff. So, you know, it's a thing. You might need admin help for it, but that is how it goes. Okay, um, hopefully that answers that question, more or less. Um, okay, uh, now I'm gonna try and get to my other tab here. Any other questions? Nope. Nope, Not okay. Right now. Okay, um, so this is the open source tool I'm gonna show you. And so this is a demo of that. Um, it's kind of a little broken. Normally there'd be a base map over here, um, but it functions like a story map tour, okay? Um, and what's nice about this one is you can really, really download the source code and really put it on your own web server if you want pretty easily because it is open source. So what this is, is it's looking at stops along the green line in Minneapolis after it opened. It's kind of trying to give people a sense of the history of the area and that kind of thing. Um, so, so open source is like if you don't have an ArcGIS account. Correct, correct. It is, it is free. It is free and available to all. Um, so it works like a tour. You can see pictures. Normally there'd be a base map there, but it's broken. I just like this one because I'm from Minneapolis. So <laughs> green room. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward as far as how the tour works. So it's a kind of a reasonable low bar example. There are some fancier examples on their site that um, I don't feel are quite as reasonable for various reasons. Um, but that one, this is very, very doable. So the tool is story map JS. Okay. Another story map. So if you search for story map JS, this will come up. If you search for story map Esri, the other tool I've been showing will come up. Storymap JS uses your Google account. And you can, I think, pretty easily make a, a Gmail account. So um, if you wanted to have a collaborative environment here, you would make a Gmail account for your group that was doing the collaboration, and then you could sign in with that. Um, I'll just do this. Um, dare I do new. I hardly ever touch this tool. So I have to admit, I'm a little. So there's your title. Um, it does have kind of the same base map options and things. Um, Stamen is really cool. I'm going to try and find the watercolor one because it's nice. Stamen, this base map, this is, sorry, this is an aside, but it's kind of a cool aside. It's one of the few digital assets that the uh, Smithsonian uh, Museum has purchased. Um, so they purchased this base map style. So it is very, very publicly available because um, the licensing on it is owned by the Smithsonian. And they've said, go ahead and use it, which I think is cool. Um, so yeah, so this functions pretty much um, like you would expect. You've got add a slide. Um, so you're going to search for your coordinates. So let's say East Lansing. Uh, and you can add a point uh, wherever you want. So I'm trying to figure out, this is probably using the watercolor map as a bad plan if I want to actually navigate. Uh, but here we go. So we could say Hannah building admin for MSU, you know, put your text there. Uh, you can have a URL to your media or you upload an image. Um, so there we go. 
and then it's there. Um, I like one thing I do like about this too is they, they do give you the option and Ezra Story Map does too, but it's sort of like a credits section. Um, it's a little harder to give credit to people. Um, I should have mentioned that when I was doing the story map. Sometimes I suggest that people at the end of their sidecar or at the end of their content actually put references and sort of try and give people credit that way. Um, it's something that I wish more people would incorporate within their content um, is actually giving credit to where they're gathering the information from. But anyway, uh, so it's nice you can do that here. Uh, Actually, yeah, so this is actually probably where I want the caption, not over there. Um, it's got marker options, you know, you can pick your own markers, so on and so forth. Um, add more slide or more things. Oop. Um, you usually have to search before it gives you the weird little little cross cue thing. Oh, here we go. Now it's there again. Um, put it somewhere. I'm going to add a second one, and then I'm going to show you what that all looks like. Uh, do Beaumont Tower edge. Open. So it will host your images for you, which is nice. Um, I don't know how to spell Carol on. Anyway, the chimes, they're nice. I'll say bells. Um, so, you know, then you can save it, preview it over here. So there's what that would look like. Um, I might make the text bigger. And then if you want to have more text, uh, let's go back to edit. Probably put that in here. More text. And go to preview. So the caption is really for the photo. And then if you want to have your text content, it's below the, the text. So that's what that looks like. Um, it's nice, like I said, because it is not proprietary in any way, shape, or form. It's put out by these people called Night Lab, which is associated with, I think, University of Chicago, big, big grant, one of those endowed grants that kind of goes on forever. Um, and this has been around for a really long time. Uh, so I have confidence that it will kind of remain active. Uh, I don't think it's vaporware. Uh, yeah. So once you've, you know, got it and you've done all that, um, you know, you can share it. This is one where, you know, once you've kind of saved it and published it or whatever, it kind of is more or less public. Like you don't have the same levels of sharing that you would with a story map because you're not tied to an organization in this one. Um, so you pretty much have private and public, well, really almost public. Like I don't really think you can really save it without making it public. So that might be a disadvantage, not sure. But anyway, so that that is an open source alternative that I like to point people to uh, if there are concerns about using a proprietary tool that is a bit of a walled garden and kind of a pain in the neck to collaborate with. Uh, so, so that's what I have for that one. It's a it's a lot simpler tool. It does not have as many bells and whistles, whistles and options, uh, but it is definitely usable and produces a nice looking result. I would say. Any questions? No questions in the chat right now. Mm. Did you want to open it up to broader Q and A time, or did you have? Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. That's that's fine. Let's let's do that. Great. Um, yeah, I'm, we have twenty three participants in the room, so feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like, or drop questions in the stop chat. Stop sharing. Can... <laughs> yeah, back to the Brady Bunch. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and Brandon has been capturing questions and answers in the agenda to agenda notes, so we'll share those out. I'm going to share out the recording of this too. So this could be a good option for maybe even your students to like go through this tutorial um, and see how to use all the different gadgets and best practices and things like that. So.
Yeah, and I do public workshops in the library. So they are open to the community. Um, if you go to the library homepage and the events page, maybe I should quick drop that in the chat. I don't know if people are interested, but um, events. So this is our library calendar. And um, I have them every semester. I don't do them over the summer, but there's a GIS category if you search for that. I also do makerspace. I have a makerspace hat. So um, I do some 3D printing workshops and things like that that are open to the public. Um, it is important to the library that we are a land grant university and we try and make things public and accessible. So community members are very welcome at my workshops. Um, I find, yeah, I like to have community members at the workshop, so feel free. Yep, and like I said too, I'm also happy to answer questions by email. So if things come up, um, you know, I can do that too. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, we have eight minutes left. So if you guys have questions, I know even if they're really specific, you know, about a specific project or something, um, Courtney and Amanda can probably help out now. Um, easy to push off like some a question to a later email, but we've got them in the room. So if you if you have questions, um, we've got the time too. So <clears throat> if folks need that, you know, trickle out and hop off, feel free to do that. Thank you guys. Um, so much for being here and I'm excited to see lots of story maps in our region and beyond. Ooh, 360 photos. Mm, good, good question. Um, yeah. Um, what I would suggest for 360 photos is hosting them somewhere where they're happy <laughs> and then embedding the web page where they're hosted. So like um, Google, I think Google Photos does 360 pretty well, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, you can put YouTube videos up as 360 YouTube videos. Um, and then I would just embed that. It doesn't really have, and it doesn't have, it, it's wearing my makerspace hat, it doesn't have a 3D model viewer or anything like that. So viewers of like alternate content, eh. It doesn't really have that. So you kind of have to embed that. But the embedding, I think, from what I've seen, works pretty well. So, you know. Lots of thank yous coming in in the chat. Thanks, everyone, for attending. That's, and that's actually, awesome. before you guys go, oh, hang on. Don't leave yet. I forgot to share. We have a little exit survey. <laughs> oh, I'll, sh I'll share it out to the, the, um... the exit survey. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've honestly given up with those because I know. Well, Zoom um, weirdly like stopped the, the third party option is like not a, an option anymore to share it as you exit, like when you leave or a survey mm. pops up. Not for me anyway. I've been digging all day today to try to figure it out. But if you guys can take the survey on your way out, um, that'll let us know. If there's other, you know, uh, story map uh, content that you want um, <clears throat> from us, you know, to, for us to host, maybe we do a, another iteration of this um, and lets us help uh, help you bring or help us bring you more professional learning opportunities. So if you want to take that on your way out um, and then still open for questions here, we still got six minutes um, on our clock here. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself too if you want to um, have more of a conversation back and forth, perhaps. Group feature will be too very helpful for our project. So that's yeah. The collab. I hope they get better and better with collaboration. I that is probably my my biggest source of frustration um, because collaboration. The other thing I will say about the groups, just to be very very clear about it, um, they have to be within your own organization. So if you have multiple organizations that have multiple ARC online instances, uh, they are, they're pretty siloed. And there are new tools to kind of connect them, but mostly it's viewing. So you can connect organizations and then they can view each other's content, but they can't really edit it. Um, and this has been just a real problem for grants. You know, obviously MSU is a big university, professors are working with other professors at big universities and they want to work on a, you know, story map or whatever it is um, to share out their stuff. And 
just isn't a good way. And there really isn't a good way to work with public and institutional account. It's just, I, every time I get Esri people in front of me, I, <laughs> I kvetch. Um, not that they listen to me, but you know. Have a feedback session. Well, I think most of our teachers are going to be working in, inside of the organization, but it could be a barrier if they want to work with an outside partner or something, you know, to have that collaborative. But there are, you know, those other options of the, the night lab. Um, one where they might be yeah. there. And, you know, if you play loosey goosey with the admin rules, I am not comfortable doing that at MSU, but, you know, um, you, you can just give, you can give people organizational accounts. Um, yeah. To sure, sure and, and sort of yeah. legitimately because you're working on the same project, so you know partnerships right. should be it should be easier. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Well, if there aren't any other questions, we can wrap it up from here. Um, I'm going to stop recording right now.